Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to our quarterly uh, chapter gathering of the uh, Southwest Pennsylvania chapter of PAIPL. Uh, our staff members and uh, board members and, and inspired guests are all here and have a lot to share. So I am going to ask Kathy Habrowski, who is the Development and Program Director, to introduce our newest staff member and tell us about the exciting events that are happening across Pennsylvania. Oh, thank you so much, Wanda. It's great to be with you all tonight. And we're so pleased at PAIPL to welcome Rainika Weimer, who was with us with a, as a fellow over the course of the past three or four months, but now she has joined us as a full-fledged employee. And she'll be working quite a bit with us in Southwestern PA as our Southwest organizer and outreach coordinator. Uh, she's a pleasure to work with. <clears throat> she's knowledgeable and personable, so I think you're gonna love working with her. Uh, Renico has a Bachelor's of Arts in Political Science and International Studies from Susquehanna University. She enjoys reading, traveling, and drinking good coffee. She is passionate about interfaith engagement and has previously led interfaith dialogue on the Susquehanna campus. Her studies have allowed her to develop an international political perspective on climate change, so that will be wonderful for us in Southwest PA. And she has been doing quite a bit of grassroots outreach with PA IPL already, so she's eager to learn more and get more involved in our interfaith response to climate change. Welcome, Renika. Um, you're welcome to say a few words if you like. Yeah, thank you. Um... I'm really excited to be working with everybody. I'm still new, but I'm really excited to move forward. Um, yeah, I think you pretty much covered everything. I'm just really excited to meet everybody and see what we'll be working on. Wonderful. We, uh, we're going to keep you busy, so <laughs> don't worry. There'll be, there'll be lots to do. Just a quick update from PAIPL, as always, feel free to reach out to me at outreach at paipl.org. And I, I think I had Renica's email. So Renica is available at Renica at paipl.org. So reach out to one or both of us for information on our latest projects. We're doing quite a bit of grant work still with the DEP Environmental Education Program grant with Caring for Creation with Southeast PAIPL, which is our virtual First Friday series. We look forward to seeing you on February 3rd from noon to one, which is just around the corner. Dee Kacherka, our um, PAIPL board member and Isaac Walton Lee vice president will be presenting on air pollution and water pollution, particularly as they're related to uh, fossil fuels and plastics and how they negatively affect human and environmental health. So Dee's an expert on the topic and I'm sure you're gonna enjoy that presentation. So the email and registration link for that will be coming out next week. So please watch for that. There will also be a Google form associated with these virtual presentations. So please take a few minutes to fill that Google form out if you can. And um, if not, get in touch with me and I'll help to walk you through it or record your responses for you because these are important for our reporting to the DEP. Um, we are moving forward still with Caring for Creation with Southwest PIPL uh, in-person dates. We're gonna have some spring dates coming up with Garfield Community Farm, uh, the Open Door Church and Valley View Presbyterian Church and Ballfield Farm and the Perry Hilltop and find you citizens councils. There's gonna be some really exciting things uh, in the works at Garfield Community Farm. We're gonna be building raised beds. We're gonna be looking at not cold frames, but um, the um, row covers that are made out of fabric. So um, that's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, we also are looking forward to some, an April delivery of blueberry shrubs and Dee and I are in the planning process of finding a partner to work with us on that. We hope to work with either Duquesne Light, which was our um, funder, or Duquesne University, or both, and maybe uh, Scouts as well, to pot these 
bare root shrubs and distribute them to environmental justice communities. Uh, so if you have a church organization or a, a faith-based organization of any kind and are interested in receiving blueberry shrubs for planting in your environmental justice community, please reach out to us. We're going to start a list. Uh, we'll serve environmental justice first, and then if we have additional shrubs at the end, we'll be able to offer them to all of our members and supporters. And I, as far as I know, Katie is our new executive director. Katie Ruth is going to be leading our bike and hike, which should still be in May of 2023. It's going to be very exciting this year. There's going to be an in-person component, and um, we, so watch for updates on the exciting uh, links for for the bike ride. That's about all I have for updates right now. Would anyone else like to share updates, like Renika or Katie or any of our board members or or attendees? I'll just quickly jump in and say, hey, um, I see some new faces on the call tonight and also some folks that I've had the privilege of getting to know over the last couple of months. It's great to see you all. I'm really glad to be here tonight and listening in. I'm going to drop a link into the chat. Um, we are currently doing some work um, asking the EPA to um, work to support stronger regulations around methane. If you are not kind of keeping up with the conversation, um, the EPA recently released some regulations. We would love to see them be stronger and they have an open public comment period. So I'll drop a link in the chat. And if you'd like to um, share your concerns with the EPA, you can do that directly through the link. So. Thanks again for being here and look for the link in the chat. Thanks, Kathy. Fantastic. Thanks, Katie. Uh, so we're going to move for oops, move forward with Wanda again. OK, yes. Tonight's reflection is in honor of our two guests and the work of PAIPL. This comes from a book by Mary Coelho, The Depth of Our Belonging, Mysticism, Physics and Healing. Brian Swim wrote in the hidden heart of the cosmos, that which gave birth to the universe is giving birth in this moment as well. We are led inexorably to reflect upon the thrilling and unnerving fact that the power that gave birth to the universe suffuses our flesh and blood. With integration within the source, the sacred presence, it is possible a pathway to the creation of a viable future may slowly emerge. This is heartening given the fundamental need for an evolution of human consciousness. With preparation, individuals and groups can learn to enter into the sacred presence so we find hope in the possibility of creative emergence. We can seek to be available to receive creative insights. The person has a greater agency and more choices, bringing hope that with wisdom, a vi viable future may emerge. There is no full understanding, but the discoveries require our attention as they are world changing for us all. Hallelujah. This evening's speakers and active uh, leaders of IPL work to exemplify the agency and choices we are creating together. They bring the hope that wisdom brings. They bring forward a viable future. Tonight's speakers. First, we will have a presentation by Dr. Patricia DeMarco on Rachel Carson's ethic, how it was interpreted into the mi mission of the Falk School of Sustainability at Chatham University and the design of the Eden Hall campus and the ways that the Rachel Carson Eco Village concept ties into Rachel Carson's philosophy. Patricia DeMarco is a native of Pittsburgh with a doctorate in biology from the University of Pittsburgh. She has spent a 50-year career in energy and environmental policy in both private and public sector positions. She serves as executive director of the Rachel Carson Homestead Association um, and as director of the Rachel Carson Institute at Chatham University, 
where she holds an appointment as senior scholar and adjunct faculty from 2011 to the present day. She holds the position of vice president of the Forest Hills Borough Council and sits on the board of trustees for Phipps Conservatory and Botanic, Botanical Gardens for the Allegheny Land Trust and for PAIPL. Her first book, titled Pathways to Our Sustainable Future, A Global Perspective from Pittsburgh, explores positive pathways towards sustainability based on 28 cases, case studies in Pittsburgh. It was published by the University of Pittsburgh Press in 2017. But her new book, In the Footsteps of Rachel Carson, Harnessing Earth's, Harnessing Earth's Healing Power, is now available on Amazon. Stephanie Danes is going to be our second uh, our presenter. And uh, she's an architect and educator. And she'll discuss the ways that the Rachel Carson Eco Village meets the concept requirements, this particular Eco Village's main goals to benchmarks, the way that the goals and benchmarks are being measured and are being achieved, and the project development. She uh, plays a huge role in doing, doing this. Um, she is a, uh, has a role as advisor and, and architect, um, and she will let us know how you can get in, involved in the Rachel Carson Eco Village and how the Eco Village enriches residents' lives while making the world a better place. Stephanie is an adjunct in the School of Architecture at Carnegie Mellon University. She has taught at Carnegie Mellon since 1979 in both full-time and part-time capacities. She is currently teaching a design studio at um, the Master of Urban Develop Design Program and coordinating the fourth year occupancy studio in the Bachelor Ar Architecture Program. Stephanie has combined a career in architecture and urban design with teaching and public service. As a lead accredited professional, Stephanie brings expertise in creating environments that are healthy and enjoyable to live in economically, to operate uh, judicious and the use of natural resources. Her design for special populations includes shelters, transitional housing, and residential environments for the elderly. Among her projects are facilities for dementia care, independent and in assisted living, skilled care, and retirement communities. She has conducted several research, study, research studies on innovative settings for cognitively impaired persons. Stephanie has published numerous articles, speaks regularly at national conferences, and has been awarded two fellowships for study. She holds a master's degree in architecture from Yale University and a bachelor's degree in architecture and urban design from Princeton University, where she graduated summa cum laude. Thank you and welcome, welcome Prince. Patty? Okay, well, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, Wanda. Your reflections are always welcome and just so inspiring. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to try to be efficient at this because we have a lot to discuss and uh, I want to give plenty of time for you to hear Stephanie too. So uh, if you will bear with me, I will put this up to share and we're going to talk about Rachel Carson's legacy. Can you see this? Yes. Okay, good. Um, we're going to talk about Rachel Carson's legacy and the main thing I like to put in perspective here is that, you know, we are not alone in the world. We're interconnected with a great deal of um, the all of the living creatures and a great deal of the inanimate part of the world as well. 
And Rachel Carson really began her ethic by that connection to the earth. Man does not live apart from the world. He lives in the midst of a complex dynamic interplay of physical, chemical, and biological forces. And between him and this environment are continuing, never-ending interactions. I realized in her time, the, the using the male pr uh, pronouns was generic to humans. But she really began with that concept that we are all connected and that we are part of nature, not in charge of nature. And her basic principle was that we take precaution in how we interface with that world because we are part of the natural world and as it does, so do we. And she was very conscious also of the future generations. Future generations are unlikely to condone our lack of prudent concern for the integrity of the natural world that supports all life. She was um, saying these kinds of sentiments frequently in most of her writing, that we have an obligation not to only ourselves, but also to future generations and preserving nature and having custody and care for preserving nature is part of our obligation as living creatures. Her environmental ethic as a precaution has really four parts. Um, one, that we should strive to live in harmony with nature as opposed to being in charge of and subjugating nature, that we should preserve and learn from natural places. She set up the National Wildlife Refuges in order to uh, make an example of how we can keep natural places to learn from. We need to minimize the effects of synthetic chemicals on the natural systems of the world. And you see this, and uh, Dee Kocherka will be talking in depth about the impact that plastic has had on so much of the systems of the world. And to consider the implications of all human actions on the global web of life, we do not take account of the unintended consequences of so many of our actions and our policy decisions. And she was very concerned about that lack of, lack of foresight, lack of care for the impact of our actions on the environment around us. And we can see today that we have had pretty ineffective controls of regulation. Um, you know, even though she put forth eloquent testimony, um, it was 10 years after her death before the EPA was established. And they have mandated safety testing for only 200 of the 85,000 industrial chemicals that are available for use today. Many of them were grandfathered and never tested. And once chemicals are in use, the burden on the EPA is so high that it has succeeded in banning or restricting only five or six substances, and often only for specific applications. Polychlorinated biphenyls, dioxin, hexavalent chromium, asbestos, uh, they did eventually ban DDT. And we do the regulation of chemicals by uh, understanding first that the risk is composed of the inherent hazard of the substance and the level of exposure that we experience. Most of our laws set limits for the permitted exposure that is allowed to be uh, tolerated in, in, um, in, a, in, in our air or in our water or in the land. And they are set by one chemical at a time. So when you issue a permit, they don't take into account that there may be hundreds of similar substances in a class or a category that are now being permitted. So as a result, over the last 50 to 100 years, nearly half of our rivers and streams and more than a third of our lakes are polluted and unfit for swimming, fishing, and drinking. And we produce 268 million tons of waste, about 140 million of that going into landfill every year. And we put 76 million tons of pollution into the atmosphere in one year alone. So air pollution is a persistent problem. Um, and you know that if we're in Pittsburgh, uh, we are among the people who suffer from bad air on a regular basis. But more than 40% of Americans are living in places with failing grades for unhealthy levels of particle pollution or ozone. And that is 2.1 million more people breathing unhealthy air 
compared to just the year before. This is the Lung Association State of the Air report for this year. And 9 million more people were affected by daily spikes in deadly particle pollution than reported last year. So we have been experiencing unhealthy and hazardous air, and it has not been improving. And we are continuing to use pesticides, but as we're beginning to experience climate change, especially in coastal areas, areas that had been Superfund sites are now overflowing into spaces with floodwaters. And so we have places like Davenport, Iowa, where the floodwaters went into farmland as well as communities. And in Houston, where seven Superfund uh, sites were flooded in Texas in 2017 um, from, from the uh, storms of Harvey. We have not anticipated the impact of having unexpected heavy weather conditions distribute toxins that were supposed to be sequestered into places like farmland and communities. So the other area that I think Rachel Carson really was uh, very concerned about was the oceans. Uh, she wrote three of her four books about the oceans and we are now seeing an inundation of plastic debris in the oceans from the equator to the poles. One square mile of ocean anywhere on earth is free of plastic pollution. And they plan in the fossil industry to increase plastic production by 40% over the next decade, making more plastic as they are moving away from burning fossil fuels for fuel. And they are looking for other sources to use this um, resource, mostly now hydrogen hubs and plastic. Um, and so this means we can expect more toxic air pollution and plastic into the oceans. And we are seeing the warming trends that have been occurring as a result of our um, imposition of uh, greenhouse gases increases. The whole thermal belt is slowing down measurably. And this has been a situation that is very alarming to the scientists who study the thermal haline circulation, because this is the thermostat of our planet. This is the way we regulate the temperature between the poles and the equator. And this is also the way we circulate nutrients throughout the entire ocean. So having that slow down uh, so that this pace is lower is uh, a very alarming development. And Rachel Carson was um, frequently writing and speaking about the chemical stew that um, is the result of having multiple sources of pollution. Our bodies do not experience contaminants one element at a time, the way the regulation is set we experience multitudes of things from multiple sources. And I think the data that we see today in chemicals found in adult samples or in children even, um, this would have been very alarming to Rachel Carson, but I think she predicted this kind of thing because they have never studied the exposure of chemicals in combination in people. We only study one item at a time and isolate those studies for control purposes. But our bodies experience a plethora of contaminants from multiple sources. And we're doing an experiment on ourselves with no controls. So we are facing a number of existential crises from global warming, pollution, and the loss of ecosystems uh, as a result of the um, climate changes that are imposed by human activity in using fossil fuels uh, and imposing um, the climate burden that we find. Uh, and this is now um, becoming an alarming situation. When Rachel Carson was talking about the interconnectedness of life, and we're now seeing millions of species threatened with extinction, many, many species that were alive and, and thriving in Rachel Carson's day are not existing anymore today or are highly compromised. So this is something that I think she forecast and forewarned about is that we have to preserve the integrity of ecosystems. We have to preserve the entirety of our um, 
of our of our living system, not just one piece at a time. And the, we have been seeing the results of this. Um, but I want to say that the looking at living in harmony with nature also gives us many of the solutions, one of them being regenerative agriculture. Um, this is something that is practiced on the Eden Hall campus and taught, uh, transforming agriculture into regenerative practices that al and also allowing urban and rural agriculture for food resilience, restoring forests and non-timber products and healing the damaged land. Um, there are many, many examples of this kind of approach being successful all across the country. And I can tell you that for the first time, the Farm Bill incorporated three years of support for shifting from uh, commercial chemical-based agriculture to regenerative agriculture practices. They have a three-year subsidy for that, regardless of the size of the farm. This is the first time that's ever happened. And we also look at moving from our fossil extraction to trash approach of materials management, which basically has been the basis for everything in our economy from the industrial revolution forward to begin looking at a circular supply chain where you can look at non-fossil feedstocks, things like kelp and bamboo and hemp, and look at designing for reuse, designing to recover and restore and reuse materials by design instead of just figuring out what you do with the trash and figuring out how to reclaim it from the trash bin and do something with it, you design from the beginning to use as little native resource as possible and to reclaim and reuse and repurpose materials as part of the manufacturing and use and recovery as a completely different way of dealing with material management. And you have to recognize the laws of nature are not negotiable. Rachel Carson talked about this all the time, that nature is the source of our strength. Nature is the source of our life support, fresh water, clean air, fertile ground, and the biodiversity of species. This is what sustains life on earth. And when we were doing the design for the Chatham Eden Hall campus, we had many, many, many long discussions at the design stage about how to transform the energy system to operate on renewable resources. And you see that much of the Eden Hall campus is supported by renewable energy systems that power the buildings and that we restored and reused, even in the, in the old parts of the building, we have managed to get um, renewable principles into the operation of those buildings. Sorry, I'm having trouble with my contraption here. And then we also converting agriculture to regenerative and permaculture practice. This is a very important part and one of the most popular and significant programs that are, that are uh, pursued at the Eden Hall campus is in the food studies program. They've, they're an award-winning program that is um, really teaching and practicing the entire operation of regenerative agriculture, which restores the fertility of the land and captures and sequesters carbon into the soil as part of that process. So we need to look at living in harmony with nature and that's where the eco village comes into play is that we look at establishing a living system that practices these principles where you live in harmony with nature and you limit the contaminants that are involved in both the construction and the use of those spaces. And that we look at the overall physical and mental health of both the people and the surrounding area. And this is, I think, one of the very uh, significant principles that come from Rachel Carson's work. And uh, this is from one of her last speeches when she was talking about the pollution of the environment. Um, and she was speaking to the uh, uh, Kaiser Permanente uh, Foundation. And she said that underlying all of these problems of introducing contamination into our world is the question of moral responsibility, not only to our own generation, but to those of the future. We're properly concerned for the health of those now alive, but the threat is infinitely greater to generations unborn 
to those who have no voice in the decisions we make today. And that fact alone makes our responsibility a heavy one. I really think that concept that we are making decisions for those who are going to endure their results, but have no voice, that is, I think, the most important thing that I take away from Rachel Carson's work is that we have a responsibility to speak for the next generation and the generation after that, because they are not in power right now and they do not have a voice in the things that are gonna shape their future. So I will end there so we have time for discussion later and uh, thank you for your attention. So, you know, we have to look pretty soon at 2050. These are my daughter and son, my grandniece, my grandchildren and my daughter and my little niece, Julia with Sarah and Amarado. We need to take bold action to secure a viable planet for those that we love. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And now, um, Stephanie, it's going to be wonderful to hear about all of the things that Eco Village is doing in your work. About two great presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for the opportunity to join you all tonight. And um, Patty, for that very inspiring talk. Um, I also want to mention that Becky Lubold is here. I'm sure you know Becky well. Um, and she is, of course, a founding member of the Eco Village. So she'll certainly be um, <clears throat> able to help answer any questions that come up um, in, in the discussion. <clears throat> so um, with the inspiring uh, background about Rachel Carson, and and we've been um, actually learning about Rachel Carson uh, with with short talks at all of our members meetings. So it's it's just a, a an seem seemingly endless um, uh, subject. Um, she has uh, been, meant so much to our our society and um, everything from her her work at, um, in saltwater marshes and uh, to her interest in eels. She's a fascinating person. Um, so um, I'd like to talk a little bit about how these principles that uh, have uh, been such a legacy from Rachel Carson have also been the inspiration for the Rachel Carson Eco Village. Um, we are uh, very uh, fortunate in having an opportunity to partner with Chatham University and particularly the Fox School of Sustainability and Environment um, because, of course, um, Rachel Carson has been um, an inspiration to those who work in the field of ecology and that campus is dedicated to furthering such work. Um, in the back of the introductory um, uh, welcome sign uh, as you enter the campus is the quote of the first line from Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. There once was a town in the heart of America where all life seemed to live in harmony with its surroundings. Such an inspiration um, to, to uh, us and certainly to uh, anyone in, who's um, on the, the campus as well. Um, <clears throat> just briefly, um, we are an eco village because we are committed to um, eco, living light, lightly on the planet and village being part of a community. Um, our model is co-housing. Uh, and there are many co-housing models around, but it's really uh, an idea where you get to know your neighbors, uh, you get to have the enjoyment of being in your own house and also the security of being a part of a community and with um, people around you who share your, your concerns. Sometimes it gets confused with a lot of other things like communes or collectives 
Um, it's not a cult. In fact, we really value the differences in people's uh, backgrounds and opinions. Um, and we are not a, a, a business. We are not a cooperative, um, but we are a community. Um, and the inspiration came from Denmark in the 1970s, where young families discovered that it was a lot easier and better to raise children together than by themselves. This idea came to the United States in the 1990s and now has spread all across the country. Um, we are one of um, over 150 communities. Um, there are some great resources out there if you're interested in eco villages and co housing. The U.S. Co Housing Association is uh, really the the um, best organization in in this country. But the Global e Eco Village Network provides some excellent resources, including uh, Communities Magazine and the Foundation for Intentional Community is another uh, organization that's got a wonderful website and lots of resources about the uh, ways that we can um, live in harmony with our neighbors. Um, Rachel Carson Eco Village had its start when Chatham University um, had a master plan in uh, 2010 for its new campus uh, for the Falk School. And in that master plan was the idea of an eco village. Um, and it was in 19, I'm sorry, in 2019 that the university released a request for proposals. Um, they got lots of different kinds of responses, but they chose uh, to work with us. Uh, and we did a lot of planning starting um, the very beginning of 2020, just before the pandemic. Um, and we have um, been building our community and also making um, a lot of progress toward the physical development of the, of the community. So here you see a um, map of our uh, intended um, village. It will sit um, very close to the entrance that that entrance marker is right about where my cursor is. Um, and we will cluster um, our houses. Each of these has um, either three in this case or two units in it. And we have three clusters of courtyards. Um, this is a slightly sloping, um, hill that looks out onto what you can see here, some really beautiful um, uh, meadow and forest. We also have a common house where we uh, take turns uh, fixing meals and enjoying uh, the chance to sit down with each other. Uh, it's also got guest rooms um, and um, some a workshop where we can share uh, tools and other kinds of equipment. So the the, the community is pretty simple. It's uh, individual houses, 35 of them all together. Two are in the common house, uh, upstairs apartments, but um, the common house itself is what uh, helps us to, to um, have, have some time together as well as on our own. Um, and you'll notice that there's a parking lot um, because we don't drive cars to our units. We keep them um, separate and uh, we, we use the opportunity to um, have, have uh, those everyday kinds of um, encounters with neighbors that used to be so common and keeps, keeps our communities together. Um, <clears throat> this gives you a couple of views of the intended uh, community. We are um, hoping to break ground uh, in just a couple of months. Uh, and you see um, on the upper view, the Ridge Road, which is very near to where that monument is. And um, 
the cluster of houses that will be along the road. Um, but we are only four acres out of 388 acres on the campus. So um, all around us are the woods and meadows. And just beyond looking at this bird's eye picture here, just beyond the community, which is in the foreground, you see the center of the campus with the Arizona Center, some of the um, the greenhouses that that Patty showed, the original farm buildings, and beyond that, the dormitory um, that that has been built already. So it's a wonderful place. We're five minutes from um, the the center of campus where there are classrooms, meeting rooms. Um, and the fitness room um, and the wonderful restaurant and cafe. Um, so while we're not down the block from a cafe, we are just five minutes walk from some, some wonderful resources. There's even an outdoor swimming pool. So it's a, it's a great place to, to live. And Chatham um, <clears throat> will be working with us in, in ways that we can take part in continuing education, including auditing classes. Um, but one of the, the exciting parts of being on this campus is to participate in the uh, gradual restoration of a healthier, diverse um, ecosystem. And we have a 30 year land management plan <clears throat> where um, we are anticipating uh, working um, on uh, the uh, restoring a, a native meadow uh, and increasing the, the woodland cover. Uh, it's very important to us um, that we are not just looking to lessen our bad impact on the environment, but find a way of life that uh, has a benign presence uh, as part of nature and the, the, um, the systems that keep us uh, healthy and uh, we, we in return want to keep those systems healthy. So <clears throat> um, we connect with the earth. Um, that's a fundamental idea that uh, is part of Rachel Carson's legacy. Here you see some ways in which we've started to um, improve the, the uh, campus by managing the knotweed or starting that process, um, also cutting down the vines that are uh, strangling the trees. Um, we have been um, fortunate in having folks like Becky uh, to uh, help us understand the ecosystem, uh, the, the, the uh, plants uh, and how it's changing. Uh, it's very important to us that we're not coming in with predetermined ideas about uh, what makes a good landscape, but we're trying to uh, learn from the land that's there. And you see in the lower picture some pic um, some of the images from the trees that we have already planted there on the campus as well. We've we've um, planted fifty trees, um, uh, and. We uh, have developed a, a plan where the community itself is conceived not as an island of suburban lawns and shrubs, but um, where we exist as part of the meadow to the north, that yellow area, and extend the wooded area, which is right now uh, kind of divided fragmented because of using the land for many years as farmland, gradually we hope to um, help bring those uh, wooded fragments together and uh, to have a um, an environment where the the genetics are healthy. It's not just the the um, the uh, plants and animals, but how they, are able to um, maintain themselves over time. Um, our buildings are going to be Passive House certified. That means that we build a very um, highly insulated 
envelope um, and seal it well, triple pane windows to reduce by um, a large uh, measure the waste of electricity or energy. It's all electric. Um, there's no combustion of fossil fuels. Uh, and you can see from the detail on the right that we're, we're building 15 inch thick walls, R70 in the roof. Um, so these buildings will operate on um, about a fifth or less of what uh, we consider good practices uh, today in, in energy conservation. This is radically better than, than good. Um, the houses are going to be manufactured in panels um, by a company outside of Baltimore that is specialists in um, being able to meet passive house standards. Um, so we're uh, going to see the the um, all of the panels for a building arrive on a truck and the bu the building will be assembled in just a few days on the um, concrete foundation that's already set for it. Um, and then um, each building will be uh, started uh, one week apart. Um, these buildings are very simple. Um, each one offers one or two bedrooms on the ground floor along with one or two bathrooms and then a stair to an upstairs, uh, which is completely open for each uh, household to customize as they would like. Um, so here, um, you can see the idea of um, a community that gathers around um, pedestrian space. Um, and on the left, you see the different kinds of um, buildings that we have uh, with one and two bedrooms that can be um, finished at, by the owner if they if they um, want to at, at to as many as four bedrooms. Um, our lifestyle um, is something that we think a lot about. We've developed policies about how we live in an earth-friendly way. Um, and we are going to have a garden in the um, organic farm. Um, we also are, are going to share tools um, and participate in both research and also some of the agricultural programs at, at Chatham. Um, the other side of what we're doing is connecting with each other. Um, you've already seen ways that we are learning together. Um, we are getting to know each other in social ways, which has been um, challenging to do online, but we have become pretty adept at Zooming with each other. Um, and occasionally we also get to go on campus um, and uh, have had the opportunity to be um, uh, represented on the three campus councils. Um, and you see Becky there, who is our representative to the Forest Field and Farm Council. Um, we use sociocratic governance, which is all about listening carefully to each other, uh, making decisions together through consent and um, be, being responsible for our own governance. Um, it is a process where the meetings are um, very structured and the decisions are made in small groups rather than in one whole room full of people. And the authority is not held by a central board, but is shared in, in each group. So each group has the responsibility um, based on its functional purpose for making the decisions in that area, whether it's on the about the land or about membership um, or about financial issues. Um, each group makes those decisions on behalf of the whole community. Um, we also have many opportunities for people in the community to take leadership roles. Um, and that helps us all to grow. Um, 
we uh, value listening to each other and being able to speak um, honestly and caringly uh, to each other. Um, and so um, this form of governance has given us a way to connect uh, with each other. It gives us a way to meet with each other um, in an enjoyable process uh, and to learn as well by uh, getting feedback on how we're doing um, at the end of each meeting, at the end of the term for uh, one uh, anyone in a leadership role, and for um, how well our policies are working as well. So, um, Kathy asked these uh, really challenging questions. So how does the eco village enrich people's lives and how will it make at least our little corner of the world a better place? Um, there are so many answers to these. Um, as uh, I think everyone who is a part of the community and there are now 60 people who are members um, and, and out of those, um, we have 20 households who have already committed to purchasing one of the units. Um, but I think these ideas, they might be said differently by different people, but the idea of living our values and being able to connect with other people while maintaining a sense of, of privacy, um, having the uh, sense that we can be healthier and happier together and we can accomplish more um, as uh, being able to work together. It's easier to um, work for the planet together. Um, and of course, there's no better place to do this than on the, the campus of the Fox School and, and in that community, we are the only independent co-housing community on an on a university campus in the country. So um, it's a really um, groundbreaking idea in a lot of ways. And we hope that it will be a model um, for ways that we can live well uh, while um, reducing our waste and having a more uh, beneficial um, relationship to uh, the land and the, the life around us. Um, we are committed to making our larger community a better place, um, working with local businesses, local farms, um, and actually teaching the, the principles of sociocratic governance to other groups as well. Um, so we hope that it will be a, a good a model to show that we can actually do this. And um, we we uh, look forward to being able to bring folks in to, to have a tour and to, to get to know us and to um, see uh, what, what we can do together. So we have a website if you'd like to learn more. And we also have a an introduction this Saturday at 10.30. Um, and there's a Zoom link here, which I will also um, put in the, the chat later, but um, you're, you're welcome to come. It gives a chance to um, hear more and to, to ask questions. So um, thank you and um, look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much. This this was really, really enlightening. You know, we've heard about um, regeneration, a lot of regeneration, you know, agriculture, and then regeneration of people and empathy, compassion, and sociocratic governance. That's all just really marvelous. Um, So if you would like to start a conversation of all that we've heard, please do. Hello, my name is Holly. I wanted to ask it, this Rachel Carson Echo Village, are you allowed to have horses? 
Yeah. Um, the, the university uh, has some uh, animals, but we're not having our own um, animals on the campus. We're helping to care for those. There are goats and chickens. I don't think there are any horses, but it would really have to be um, something that the uh, the university um, was was uh, part of. Um, oh, like I many. see. So you yourself couldn't bring your cat or dog with you? Oh no, we have definitely have more of the domestic pets. Yes. Okay. Okay. We are we are pet friendly community. Yeah. Well, it seems like it sounds like a wonderful idea, but um, and also you said people are buying some of the units, I guess. Yes. So how does that work out if it's on university property? Do you have a deed, a legal deed to your to your home? Um, yes. Or is it I mean, and if you should pass, is it sold? back to the university or someone else? It's a, it's a great question. Um, these The university owns the land, but we own the houses. So they are condominium. Uh, and you um, can bequeath your house to anyone who wants to be a part of the community. So it could go to your, your children or you could um, sell it. Uh, but again, we, we will keep a waiting list uh, of people who are interested in this uh, life um, because uh, it's very important for the continuity of the community um, that people who come in maybe 10, 20 years from now are also people who really want to be part of a community and a, an ecological ethic. Okay. So is it more that, you know, you're expected full-time to um, work um, on that campus and in that community, or can people have uh, jobs off-site? Um, everybody has their own jobs or their own life. Uh, our commitment to volunteering is about four to eight hours a month. Wow, that's not too bad. Sounds like a wonderful idea, but, and with all that acreage, if I couldn't have a horse, I'd there, yeah, I'd be I'd be at a loss even there, though it there, sounds wonderful um yeah. there are stables nearby but I don't think that there's any way to to bring a horse right onto campus yeah that would yeah that would that would be a bummer for me so I mean but it sounds like a wonderful idea um so maybe I'll just check out the uh zoom uh virtual zoom session this Saturday okay that thank you very welcome. Hi, I would like to add something or have a question really. Uh, first, I just want to say thanks for putting out all of this information and, you know, all the effort and intention that has gone into the plans and um, from someone else that is also trying to love and protect the earth. It's just appreciated. Um, for the eco village, would there be some sort of scouting process since everyone would be working together so close knit or how is there any sort of process like that that you've been thinking of? So the, the process of joining the community is a self selection. Um, we invite everyone to come to the introduction to see if you'd like to learn more and then you can become an explorer with the community. Um, at some point, once you have learned about sociocracy and how to participate uh, and have a chance to um, see what it's like working with others in the community, you can decide for yourself if this is the, the place that really fits. Um, we don't have a formal screening. We make sure that everybody understands what, what they're getting into, um, but uh, we, we we count on people to decide for themselves what's the best thing, and that's that works really well. So in the the units that we still have available, um, we'll invite people to to join us to become, you know, part of, of participating <clears throat> in our planning process and then deciding for yourself if this is the right 
the right place for you. I Did see you? that Gail, Gail Newstadt has her hand raised. Thanks, Gail. Sorry, there I am. <laughs> um, this sounds fabulous. I would like to sign on the dotted line right now and move right now, but <laughs> that's impossible right now. However, I have a question about uh, how you came up with the name Eden. You have the that name on the Chatham campus at Eden Hall, and now you have um, this new wonderful village that you're creating with the word Eden in it. And I'm wondering how, is this like the Garden of Eden? Is that the source or some other source? It was the Eden Hall Foundation who gave the land to Chatham. So is that E T O N or E D E N? E D E N, Eden Hall. E D Eden Hall Foundation. Just, just like the Garden of Eden. Yeah, it is. It's the same word, but it was really the the foundation that gave the land to Chatham that came. The back. reason uh, the reason I'm curious, and I'm just throwing this out right now, is because presently I'm living in uh, Swickley in the Masonic Village. And their philosophy is the Eden alternative, which is something completely different, but very much like what you are, the philosophy itself, what you are talking about. So yeah, I would love to have them learn from you in order to improve what's going on here, perhaps. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be pursuing that. So I'm on the sustainability committee and the Envision the, the Future Committee, and we're all about the birds and the bees. So <laughs> we're elderly. So here you go. Thank you so, so much for everything everybody is doing. It's absolutely phenomenal. Great. Thank you. So welcome, Gail. Can I connect you too? Can I connect Stephanie with, uh, with Gail? Oh, totally. Okay, great. Thanks. That'd be great. Thanks, Kathy. You're welcome. I have a question. Did was did Eden Hall come from Heinz Corporation? No, um, I don't think it was Heinz. I think it was a different foundation. I, I may be confusing, getting confused with a um, a different place out in that area. But my uh, mother in law's good friend was a legal secretary for Heinz Corporation, and that that Heinz no, the Heinz had, the Heinz factory yes i used that location which is the old lodge house as yes okay that's for, what I thought. especially the women pickle packers yes yes there for vacation to get out of the smoke and the pollution and the disaster of pittsburgh and get a little a little you know i think yeah. they did week at a time vacations for yes the yes worked in and, their factories and that was the original use of that space and yes. if you go if you go behind the old lodge there's a trail that goes down to a pond you can see the piers left there where there had been a dock where they swam at that, time, at that time they had horses that would take the women down that almost a mile um trail and there was a boathouse there, and they had boating and swimming, and in the winter, ice skating on that little pond. Oh, how fabulous! And you know that there, was... and you can see some of the posts and some of the uh, now you know completely deteriorated wooden structures that were there at one time as yeah. a you know recreational facility. They had a bowling alley, you know. <laughs> oh my gosh, all of that. Well, yeah. my. Um, my mother-in-law's uh, friend, um, they still went to that, I think, in, in the 1990s. And she was, boy, she and her friends were real upset when Heinz decided to sell that. That's right. Yeah. So thank you. I thought it was what that was. But then um, Eden Hall got it from Heinz? I don't know what happened in between. There were financial transactions among the you know, okay, uh, well, that's good to hear. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. I, I just did a little quick research on the Eden Hall Foundation, and apparently uh, there was a gentleman named Sebastian Mueller, who was a man of humility and vision who took action to help those in need. He created the Eden Hall Foundation uh, 
so that his beloved causes and empathy for others live on. And there's a little timeline. Uh, so it says that the foundation was named after Eden Hall Farm, his summer home in Richland Township, which is, I believe, the land that was then donated to Chatham. So he was a Heinz employee of a factory, uh, a factory employee, and he was a cousin of H.J. Heinz. Oh. He, he married Elizabeth Hines, the younger sister of H.J. Hines, so I guess he married his cousin. And um, they had children, and they brought employees from Hines to the farm, but I believe he owned the farm, okay. not Hines. Well, thank you. That's very interesting. Sure, yeah. And there's a statue of him in the, uh, in the old lodge in the courtyard. Oh, okay. There's a koi pond there, and his statue overlooks it from inside. It's quite Oh, nice. how cool is that? Thank yeah. you. Thank you for reminding me that history, Kathy. You're very efficient. Sure. I, I, I was very curious because I remember when Chatham began this, this program and this development. It, they launched the, they announced the um, Eden Hall campus on my 50th birthday. So I, I thought there were some kind of special <laughs> significance there. Now I'm dating myself, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's very interesting. Sure. Yeah, he was a wonderful man uh, to leave that legacy. Oh, yeah. To others. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? I, I guess I would, um, I'd like to just kind of emphasize the sociocracy and this um, idea of brave spaces, safe spaces. Um, I know very little about sociocracy, but I think it it has to be brave to start this kind of, of uh, governance. It, it's been really fundamental. We've all been learning, um, but it is a remarkable experience to um, find so much that we can do together. Um, and it's pretty simple, but um, it, it all goes back to the idea that whatever we do together, it's not just about making good decisions, it's about becoming more connected with each other. And that's the genius of it. So we've, we've benefited a lot from the the people who are experts at it and have given us um, a lot of, of teaching. That's wonderful. Thank you. I think the other question uh, is to Patty. I wanted to know a little bit more about your book because it says harnessing Earth's healing power. Oh, good heavens, thank you. Um, well, you know, Rachel Carson was my inspiration for a lot of reasons, but she was also a breast cancer survivor. And she was writing Silent Spring at a time when she was really undergoing the most brutal version of treatment for breast cancer ever imagined. And it's not improved a tremendous amount, but it has a much better outcome than it did in her day. So I was always you know, inspired by the fact that even though she was really in her last days and very ill, she persisted in finishing Silent Spring against horrendous odds with tremendous headwinds. I mean, all of her friends were encouraging her to just let it go, Rachel. It's going to be killing you. You know, I, I've read some of the letters, you know, correspondence that she had with her friends in those last years, and it just breaks your heart. But I was thinking about how her sense of purpose really drove her through, you know, the endurance, the persistence, the courage to continue in spite of her physical condition. And I took a great deal of inspiration from that as I was going through my own cancer experiences. And I, um, in many ways, used her approach to dealing with a hardship of an illness that really was undergone, especially in, in my time in Alaska, in a very public place. I was a commissioner sitting, you know, I had to adjourn meetings to go throw up in the ladies room, you know, things like that. And so I, I was, I shared that experience of hers of being in a public position and having to kind of camouflage an illness. 
And I did what she did. I wrote, I wrote natural history essays. I have a stack of them, um, you know, that I called through and condensed in order to make them, first of all, legible and understandable to other people. There were many of them. I couldn't even read my own writing because my neuropathy was so compromised that I couldn't read what I had written at that time. But I have been through four cancers and the things that they give you to read while you're waiting in the waiting room or while you're, you know, being given things to inspire you, you know, it, it just didn't resonate for me at all. Uh, you know, first of all, the clinical ones are just too depressing. What do you do when your hair falls out? What happens when you lose your eyebrows? I mean, really, it's, it's depressing enough without having to read about it, you know, and then you, you get on the other side, you know, the spiritual things where you have to go pray. And well, I've been thrown out of three churches so far, so that didn't work for me at all. I found that uh, connecting to nature worked. And I, especially this last um, two rounds of cancer that I had in 2017 and 2018, it was my elder tree spirits that got me through that. And so I wrote it. I wrote it down to share so that maybe other people will find that connecting to nature is really a touchstone for your own inner strength. And I really truly believe that. So I wrote it down in a series of little essays um, in four sections that um, you know you can you can read and see, you know maybe, you know my following in Rachel Carson's footsteps might help other people do the same. Thank and, you. And, yeah, I, I'm having an official book launch on the 23rd of February at Chatham. Um, they decided to host it for me, so it will be on the 23rd of February from six to eight. And I'll send you all invitations. So you oh, thank <laughs> you're you. welcome to come. <laughs> thank you. Yes, yes. So that sense of purpose that Patty's describing and Stephanie's illustrating and describing in the, in, in the um, Rachel Carson Eco Village seems to be really what ties it all together. And where would we be without a sense of purpose in our lives? Unfortunately, I, I know many people who don't have a sense of purpose in their work and they're just going to work every day, working the hours, coming home, having a glass of wine or a beer and watching TV and it's just not fulfilling. So it's, it's wonderful to see that this, this type of existence still lives on. And I think it's a great model for our young people it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for not only <clears throat> for all ages, but particularly for our young people to understand that their work and their life can still have a purpose at a time when they are often discouraged because of the state of world affairs and climate change. So I thank you both for sharing that information with us to keep my hope alive. And I hope everybody else's hope alive as well. Thank you. I, I, you know, I've been following Kiersey's work. Kiersey's with us still. And hello, Kiersey, um, about, you know, caring for the earth and caring for ourselves. And, you know, creation care is a great deal of what the Pennsylvania Interfaith Power and Light is focused on. And it really does reinforce your sense of well-being when you're seeing that the world around you is thriving and well and healthy. Um, it's very difficult to have that feeling if you're living in a place that isn't. And finding so much of the city refurbishment coming through green spaces, taking you know abandoned lots and making them gardens, taking fallen down buildings or condemned buildings and turning them into green spaces with trees and places to sit and gather in community. I think that's going on all across Pittsburgh. I mean, there are hundreds now of urban farms where communities are forming around food growing. And I think this is symbolic of the fact that when you have living systems among your living spaces, everybody is healthier, including the living things that share the spaces. Kirsty, I don't know if you want to comment on any of that at all. Good to see you. Good to see you all, and thank you for your inspiring presentations, both Patty and Stephanie. And uh, yeah, I, I fully agree, and and uh, maybe I'll just add on the the one that um, 
the, the decision making process, what you are doing is just so inspiring. And that's why I like the work that the work that I'm doing right now, and I've been so following on Patty's footsteps, is to somehow like what does it mean? So right now I'm doing these self-care earth care sessions. And I think one of the essential part of that is also that once we pause and start taking care of ourselves, then all the decision making becomes easier. So that's why it's just somehow feels that it's it's not just something luxury and that we have to do but it's like if we do it then everything else flows much more easily so maybe that's the only thing i would like to add well it's it's inspiring to meet you kersi because i have loved your photographs so to hear about your your work um in in the for for all of us in the steps of Rachel Carson, one way or another here gathered together, it's wonderful to, to be with kindred spirits. So thank you all. Yes, yes. Hey, Kathy, uh, do you have any last words that you would like to leave with us? And then I will get on to my reflection for the evening. Only to thank everybody again for joining us tonight. This the session will be recorded. So when we send out the link to you, please share it with your friends and family so that we can send this message further and wider. And um, I'm going to share screen again so that we can enjoy some snowflakes while Wanda leads us out with a closing prayer. Let me see if I can make this happen. Here we go. Well, um, I'd like to leave you all with the words of Pablo Casals that speak to our lives and the lives of our speakers. It takes courage for a person to listen to their own goodness and act on it. Do we dare to be ourselves? Do we dare? May it always be so. Amen. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you. Well, we hope to see you all soon. And uh, everyone, until then, take care. And Wanda's wise words are always a blessing. <laughs> Have a joyous evening. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you too. Thank you. Bye.